Welcome to our question and answer session for the month of February. We have questions coming from uh, people who are interested in the Dhamma and they've been sending questions through emails. And now we will read this email, this question. Number one. One from Tony Romeo. Tony Romeo from Las Vegas. Yes. Okay. Go My ahead. My question, is it wrong to use strong language if it has no ill will will when using it? Yes, language is a way of communicating your your intention or your purpose. Sometimes if you speak softly, people might not get the message. So sometimes you have to speak strongly to indicate the seriousness of, the, of what you say. As long as there are no emotion involved, it's okay. You use it according to the, the, the reason. Sometimes even the Buddha used strong language, admonishing the monks. You sometimes call the monk, you foolish monk, just to indicate the seriousness of his situation. So, as long as you are not really angry, it's okay. Yeah. Question number one from Newark, New Jersey, USA, from Martin Kito. Is it possible for a meditator to achieve samadhi or nibbana while doing metta meditation? Metta meditation is more used to... to Get rid of your anger, which is a hindrance to your meditation practice. Sometimes when you meditate, you're still angry at some people. So you cannot focus on your breathing, on your breath, on your mantra. Then you should use uh, metta pavana to, to, let, to eliminate your anger first. Yeah by saying that I forgive you what that you have done, you know, I do not uh, want to uh, be, take any revenge or anything from you. Yeah. I forgive you, forgive you, forgive you. Then maybe eventually your, your anger will disappear. Once your anger disappears, then you still have to come back and use the, the regular mantra, the regular meditation object, which is the breath. Uh, a mantra in order to bring the mind into full concentration. Yeah. These other types of uh, meditation objects are used to, to, to stop the defilement that cause the mind to be restless or agitated. Yeah. His next question from New Jersey, USA. There are some saying that Jesus and the Buddha are almost identical. And some monastery where monks Christian monks spend there in contemplation and prayers. Some of these practices are very similar to the repetition of the Bhutto. For example, they have a very short prayers where they repeat them for a long period of time. So is it possible for a Christian monk to obtain enlightenment? Uh, most religion teaches the development of the spirit, but they could only develop to the level of samadhi, with the exception of Buddhism, which has the ability to develop to, to enlightenment. To, because in order to become enlightened, you need to understand the, the Four Noble Truths. Yeah. If you don't see the Four Noble Truths in your mind, you will never be enlightened. Yeah. With, most religion will teach people the two, the three, uh, three steps of spiritual development. First, charity. Second, keeping the precept or sila. Thirdly, calming the mind by concentrating the mind on something. Some religion use singing as a way of calming the mind. You go to Christian churches and they'll sing, sing. Praise God, that way it keeps your mind away from your trouble, see. So it's like meditating. Or some, 
some use some kind of a chant, but these are just the, on the level of samadhi or calm. Not, not a single religion teaches the Four Noble Truths. So without the Four Noble Truths, no, you cannot become enlightened. Because to become enlightened is to realize that your, your, the cause of your mental pain or anguish arises from your desire, from your cravings. And your birth are caused by your cravings. So if you can re- eliminate your cravings or desire, then you can, come, you can uproot all of your mental anguish or suffering. And in order to do this, you need to know the Four Noble Truths. Know that to follow your craving is, is, is bad for you. It will only hurt you because what you crave for or desire for will only last temporarily. And once you lose it, you will become sad. So if you see this, then you will stop your craving and your desire for things, for people, for anything. Once you have no desire, then you, your mind will be completely peaceful and happy. And it doesn't have to take a new body to use it as the means of uh, satisfying the mind. Question number three from Norway, from Elizabeth Weber. What to do at the moment of death? You should do it now. You should pretend that you are dying and to, to control your mind, not to become agitated or afraid. And the way to do it is you need to have mindfulness. So you have to do it now before you die. You have to practice dying before you die. You have to pretend that maybe you are dying right now. And, and the only thing that will keep your mind peaceful and calm and not hurt by dying is mindfulness. So you have to practice mindfulness until you become able to calm your mind, enter into jhana or samadhi. Once you know that when you die, then all you have to do is enter into jhana. Then your mind will not be hurt. And once you have jhana, you can also develop the next method of coping with death by using vipassana or insight, by understanding that the body isn't you, you are the mind, you look after the body, the body is like your servant. So you should not cling to your body when your body wants to leave you. So if you can understand this, this truth, truth that the body is not you, you, you are the mind, you are the one that is looking after this body. But you, you, are not ab- you will not be able to keep your body forever. One day, sooner or later, your body will have to die. And if you know this fact and let the body die, then you will not be hurt. So this is the, the second way of coping with death, by using knowledge or insight. But to, use, to, to do this, you need to have the first, the first level first. You have to have a calm, and detach mind before you can detach yourself from the body. If your mind is not calm, it will cling to the body and it will have the desire for the body to, to get well, not to die. And this desire will cause the mind anguish and suffering. You see. Her next question, how not to lose track of the path of Tama when the body dies? Well, if you have mindfulness, then you will not lose the Dhamma, I see. Her next question, could you elaborate on the difference of right Samadhi and Satipanya? Samadhi has two different distinct types, actually three, three, sub, three, three types of Samadhi. Kanika Samadhi, Apana Samadhi, and Upajara Samadhi. Kanika Samadhi and Apana Samadhi is considered to be the right kind of Samadhi because it gives you calm, peace, and ubeka, which means your mind becomes undisturbed by whatever happens. 
whatever phenomena that might come into contact with the mind will not be able to move the mind. The mind can remain uh, undisturbed by all forms of phenomena. And this kind of samadhi has to, kanika means it has a brief duration. And apana samadhi means longer duration. When you first meditate, you will experience the first type, the, the kanika samadhi. Your mind will become calm, peaceful, briefly, and then it will withdraw and from that state. But if you keep practicing mindfulness, then you, as your mindfulness becomes stronger, then you will be able to remain in peace and calm much longer. The, the other kind of samadhi, which is not the right kind, is upachara. This is the kind of samadhi that enables you to have psychic powers. The ability to uh, recollect past lives, the ability to connect with the spiritual beings, the ability to uh, to read the mind of other people come from this type of samadhi. This type of samadhi happen after you have apana samadhi. When you un- enter into calm, then the mind dash out again. But it doesn't dash back to the normal state of mind. It dash into this state of mind which it can have psychic powers. This is not good samadhi because it doesn't have ubeka, meaning it the mind still can be agitated, restless, and disturbed by the events that it comes into contact with. So this is not the type of samadhi that the Buddha encourages us to to develop. He urges us to develop the the calm and peaceful and un, undisturbed samadhi, you know, which we can which we can use it to to destroy the defilements. After we come out of this samadhi, we can then use insight to teach the mind to stop all forms of cravings and desire. With this type of samadhi, you will be able to resist all forms of cravings or desire. Then your, all this craving and desire will eventually disappear from your mind because you're not uh, nurturing it, you're stopping it by resisting, by not following, by not doing what it asks you to do. Then your mind will become, fu- become fully enlightened when there are no more desire left in your mind. And Satipanya. Satipanya is, in, panya is wisdom or insight. Sati is mindfulness. You, know. you need mindfulness to make the mind have samadhi. You, have, you need panya, which is insight or knowledge, to teach the mind the, the, the damage that the, your desire and your craving will create for you, so that you will not uh, support or nurture it. You will resist and stop it instead. Her next question, I meditate a lot, sometimes many hours a day. Sometimes I can, for example, be, the, be in a very blissful and bright state of over time, where there is light, thoughts arising, and the mind feels upeka like. Then, all of a sudden, I can enter into a negative mood, unable to let go. What do you recommend me to do then? Well, you have to use mindfulness to stop it, see. As soon as your mind starts to go in the negative direction, you pull it back by using mindfulness either using a mantra or something. If you have strong mindfulness, you might not even need to have a mantra. You just tell it to stop or direct it to think the other way. If you cannot stop or let it think the other way, it means your mindfulness is not strong. Then you need to use a mantra or something to concentrate your mind to bring, to bring back mindfulness. Question number seven from Simon Neck from Italy. Uh, hello Ajahn, this is Simon, the Italian practitioner who came here last week. Could you please talk about Mara and how about the five Maras? Maras are just the personification of evil. Uh, the evil that we do like hate, uh, greed, hate, delusion. 
these are maras. They are the negative factor, mental factor that will generate suffering for the mind. If you want to know the detail of the the maras, you have to go into the internet, go into Google and search for the five maras. I have no no specific knowledge of this thing, but I just know it generally that mara refers to the negative forces in the in in your mind that will generate uh, generate have a sadness. Uh, or anguish or suffering, and you need mindfulness and wisdom to eliminate them. Question number eight from Dharma Sami, Myanmar. Venerable sir, I am a lay yogi currently practicing in Myanmar. I wish to ask you about meditation method. Do you teach the jhana attainments? No, just teach the 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 the, the triple training actually. Sila, Samadhi, and Panya. Sila, you have to keep at least if you want to if you want to be a meditation meditator, you need to keep at least the eight precepts. If you ordain as a monk, then you have to keep the two hundred twenty-seven precepts. This will uh, prevent the mind from uh, running away. It's like a, a fence that will keep the mind in one place. So that will be easy for for the next step of practice, which is samadhi, uh, calming the mind, stopping the mind from any action. Because when the mind becomes calm and inactive, the mind becomes happy. Then once the mind becomes happy, the mind doesn't need to have anything to make it happy. So when it withdraws from this samadhi, and should th- th- there are still cravings in the mind, when they arise, then we have to develop uh, the knowledge that the Buddha taught us, that that the the cravings or desire are are the problem; they are not the solution. So don't use them, don't follow them, because if you follow them, they will bring you into more problems and troubles. It is the one that will lead you to rebirth. So if you don't want to go through rebirth, you don't want to run into problem and trouble, then you must not follow your desire or your craving. You should stop, you know, resist. Like when you want to smoke a cigarette, you should resist. Because if you keep following if you, your desire, it will keep coming back and ask for more. You smoke one cigarette, then a few moments later, it will ask you to for another cigarette. But if you say, no, you know, I don't want to smoke anymore, every time it comes back, you just repeat the same thing. Eventually, it will not come back because it cannot get what it asked you for. But you might not be able to withstand the desire, the pain that arises from the desire, if, if you have no samadhi. But if you have samadhi or jhana, then there will be no painful uh, feeling when there are desiring arises and you can resist the desire and eliminate the desire from your mind. Question number nine from Suriname, South America from Alex Yakomo. What is the difference between Samadhi and Jhana? Same thing. Jhana is, means the different level of Samadhi. There are eight levels of Jhana. Samadhi means the, the, the mental, sub, mental calmness and jhana means the different level of calmness. The first level is not as, is not as calm as the second level, the third and so forth, until the, the eighth level. Question number 10 from Katrina from Australia. Is it jhana when the breath appears to stop? No, the breath the breath, it, it just means that your, your mind is watching the breath, that's all. It becomes jhana when, when the, the mind enters into calm, and the, the, it pay no longer pay any attention to the breath. You know. Is there something else beyond it? Beyond the yeah, it, you can go deeper into deeper, deeper calm. See, 
the, the fourth jhana is, when, is where we usually uh, get when the mind has uh, stopped uh, paying attention to the, the body. Uh, it becomes uh, still and happy by itself. But sometimes it, still, it, it can still hear things and can still feel the body, but the mind is not disturbed by what it hears or what it feels. And this is the fourth jhana. But if you want to go deeper, you have to concentrate the mind more. Then you will go into the arupa jhana. But it's not necessary to go that deep. If you want to just to develop uh, enlightenment, you, want, you just need the fourth jhana. And when you withdraw from the fourth jhana back to the normal state of mind, then you try to teach your mind that everything that the mind craves for are, are impermanent, that they will cause you suffering because they will change or they will disappear one day. So when your mind wants to have anything, if it knows that it's going to end up in suffering, then it will not want to have those things. Then you can stop your desire or your craving for things and people. Once you have no craving and desire, then there will be no mental agitation, restlessness, or anguish, or suffering left in the mind. Her next question, is reaching jhana make someone become a sotapanna? Is what? Reaching jhana. No, jhana just makes the mind calm. It, it will support the practice of becoming a sotapanna because the sotapanna must let go of its desire to cling to the body. Yeah. The desire not to get old, not to get sick, not to die. Yeah. With, with the sotapanna, he will understand that the mental suffering arises from the cravings for, for not to get old, not to get sick, and not to die. And if you, want, if you don't want to suffer due to aging, sickness, and death, then you must not have any desire for the body, not to get old, get sick, or die. You have to let the body go. Let the body get old, get sick, or die. If you have no jhana, you will not be able to let go. Even, the, even if you know that your suffering is caused by your attachment to your body. But if you have jhana, and when you know that you, you, your suffering is caused by your attachment to your body. Then you, if you don't want to be, you don't want to suffer. Then you just let the body go, leave the body alone. You can do this with jhana as your support. Question number twelve: Can one reach nibbana by just observing the breath? No, no, not. You need to. You have to get rid of the ten fetters in order to reach Nibbāna. If, if you want to know what they are, you can Google it, the ten fetters. Question number 13. What is the most important thing to teach your children? Teach them to be good, be kind. Uh, teach them to... Uh, uh, good means to keep the precept, really. Uh, not to hurt other people. Not, not to steal things from other people. Uh, be kind, help other people if, you, if they need help. You know, don't be, uh, be cold-hearted. You know. Be kind, help other people. You know. So mainly mean to be good and be kind for children. You know. That's all they need to know for now. But as they grow up, then you might be able to teach them more how to become calm, how to become mindful. You know how to see things as they are, rather than what you think they are. This is gradual learning, gradual teaching. You cannot teach everything at the same time. Next question, number 14 from Australia. How do you know if a relationship is too abusive to stay on? Is it better to stay in a relationship if you have a children? It depends on how much you can handle the the hurtfulness that you have to face. If you say it's beyond your ability to, to, to endure this hurtfulness, then you have to leave. So, then 
you can live very easily if you think that eventually we're all going to die. Whether you, your husband, your wife, or your children, whether you stay together or not stay together, eventually we're all going to die. So once you can see this, then you find living quite easy. Yeah. Question number 15 from Indonesia, from Jeffrey Lim. Do you believe in pati dana or transferring of merits? If yes, how does it work? If not, is there a way to help our ancestors who are born in a miserable world? The Buddha said you can share some of the merit that you make, but very small amount. The merit that you share is like the money you give to beggars. People who die, and before they die, they did not make any merit. So when they die, they don't have any merit with them. See? So you can share the merit to those people, but you can only help them like you help beggars, yeah. just to help them to have um, maybe some food or something to drink, that's all. Not, not much, but it's better than nothing. Yeah. His next question, what is the difference between mindfulness and concentration? Pretty much similar. When you're mindful, you are careful. When you're careful, you have to concentrate on what you do. So it's pretty much the same thing, really. You can say concentration or mindful or careful. His next question, how do we practice walking meditation? Just be, be careful what you do, what you, how you walk. Know, what you, know that you are walking. Don't let your, your mind go somewhere else. Let your mind stay fixed with your walking. Then you are, you are doing walking meditation. His next question. I became a novice <coughs> less than two months, but I'm required to be able to talk Dhamma to the laity. So I ask your advice. If you don't know anything, just say you don't know. You, know, you don't have to, to teach people. As monks, we are not... When we, when we first be, become monk, the, the requirement is for us to learn, to study, to practice. As far as teaching, this is, con this is uh, what we call optional. And we should only do it after we have graduated, we have become enlightened. Some teachers who have became enlightened, they don't teach some of them. If they, f they, they find it difficult for them to teach, they just don't teach. Or they might just teach very simple, teach by their action. They, they might not be uh, charismatic in, 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 in talking. So sometimes they, ha they don't teach by talking, they teach by their behavior, by their conduct. So don't feel that you have to teach. If you don't have anything to say, just say so. Say, just say you don't know, that's all. Next question, number 19, from Sapril Chai, Indonesia. When I meditate, when pity appears, happiness arises, but I cannot maintain it forever. So I think that happiness from meditation or jhana is not eternal, it's anicca. Is it true? Yes, when you come out, it disappears, but you can, you can always go back, see. You can always go back. It's, it's the easier way of getting happy than going to a bar to drink, or go to a party, or go to a movie. Because that requires money, that requires your body to be strong. But your body will one day not going to be strong. Or you won't have money to, to spend. Then you will not be able to have that kind of happiness. But with meditation, you can meditate under any circumstances. When you know how to meditate, even if your body gets old, gets sick, you can still meditate and you can still be happy. But it's a, it's a step to the permanent happiness. See, from, this, from, from meditation you can move up to, to insight, to knowledge. If you learn the knowledge that the cause of your unhappiness are your desire or your craving, then all you have to do is resist your desire, stop your cravings. Once you can overcome your desire or craving, then they will not bother you. Then they will not cause any uh, sadness or unhappiness in your mind. Then your mind will always be happy. This will be the permanent type of happiness. 
Question number 20. As a householder, I'm dragged into worldly things and then I experience disappointment and suffering. I meditate and I become calm, but this calmness vanish and then I am sad again and then I go back to meditate again, but yet the calmness vanish again. So I think this happiness is the knowing that everything comes and goes. Having this knowledge arises, is this the piece of happiness that the Buddha taught and is this the goal of the teaching of the Buddha? Yes, once you see that everything comes and goes, then you, you let go of them. You have no cravings for them. Once there are no cravings in your mind left, then your mind will be permanently happy. His next question. I think teaching the teaching of the Buddha is very difficult to do when we are householders who are faced with various kinds of sensual pleasure. But on the other hand, we still have to continue to do practice. How do we do this? Practice as a householder? Well, you just have to find time for the practice. Yeah. Try to stop activities that you don't need to, to do, like watching movies, uh, playing games. Instead, use this time for your meditation practice. Yeah. So you have to try to find time to do the Dharma practice. Then as you do more practice, your mind becomes stronger and happier then you can let go of other activities. And eventually you can even stop working and go and become a monk or become a nun. So you have to start from where you are first. Try to use your time wisely. Question number 22 from Mariam Jasayeri from Southern California, USA. As you mentioned that each body part goes back to its origin. So what is the origin of the one who knows? Where is it made of and where does it come from? The, the one who knows is a, an element, which is uh, a, a distinct, it is not composed of anything. So it doesn't break up or it doesn't change. It, 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 is, it is the knowing element. So in this, in this entire universal ex universe, there are six basic elements. You can say they are the building blocks of everything. The earth element, the fire element, the air element, and the water element, and the space element, and the knowing element. The consciousness is the knowing element. When they combine, they mix up people, animals. Some without the, the knowing element becomes trees and mountains and so forth. These are, are the uh, are the things that are um, made from the, the six basic elements. You know. That doesn't change, doesn't break up. Mm. It's always, water will always be water, air will be always be air, earth will always be earth. Yeah. So these are the six elements. And the knowing, uh, the mind is one of these elements. Her next question, where does the one who knows go after death? The one who, who knows never go anywhere. The one who knows doesn't have any size or shape. So it doesn't travel like the body. See? With the body, you have size and shape. So it moves around. With the mind, it has no size and shape. So it dwells in the psychic world. If you want to say where, it's the spiritual world or the psychic world. And the mind moves by thinking. See, That's all. So when, there, when, when the mind has become enlightened, it stops thinking, it stops desiring, it stops uh, attach, attaching itself to a new, a new form of body, a new body. Like the Buddha, he doesn't send his mind to become attached to anybody anymore. But us, when we lose this body, but we still have desire to use the body for our pleasure, so we go look for a new body. When there's somebody creating a new body, then the mind will then send its uh, stream of consciousness to connect to that body. So in effect, the mind always remains in one place. Next question from Rose, Space Coast, United States. Can you explain to us what type of meditation was the Lord Buddha did when he got enlightenment? 
Wasi Dui Samata Bhavana or Vipassana Bhavana. When the Buddha became enlightened, yeah. both he need, first he developed the the samatha pavana calm calm his mind. After his mind becomes calm, when he withdraw from this state of mind, then he start to investigate the cause of his suffering, and he discover there are the the three cravings or desire, the this, the craving for sensual pleasures, the craving for beings and the craving for not being. So once he know this, then he just got rid of this by not following this craving. The craving, when, when, when the, this craving cannot arise, when they're not being supported or being supplied with, with what it asks for, then it will eventually diminish and disappear. Then the, mind, the Buddha's mind become pure. Next question, number 25. Is that right that we should educate, teach, and force our vinyana mental consciousness to practice discernment according to the right view, four noble truths, and the three characteristics of existence, anicca, dukkha, anatta, until we have direct experience of the four noble truths? Well, you first have to develop jhana or samadhi first before you can effectively teach your mind the anicca, dukkha, anatta, the Four Noble Truths, the Three Characteristics, because you need to educate the mind so that it will stop desiring or craving for things that are causing dukkha to the mind, which, it, which it means everything that the mind, uh, the mind desires through the body. So, you need both, you need first to develop samadhi or jhana. Then, then you have to teach the mind about the Four Noble Truths and the three characteristics of existence. Is that true that sanya and vedana are backpack of all our past karma? Well, sanya con- con- is called memory, see. So it's like, like a computer hard disk, you know. That's where you you put everything, all the information that you have acquired in the hard disk. So the mind is like a hard disk. The memory, it's a, sanya is the memory. Why vetana are sensations that the mind feel, feel through the body. When the body uh, gets sick, it feels painful. When the, mind, when the body is not sick, it doesn't feel painful. So these are sensations coming through the body. Or, or what the mind see, what, what the body sees can create a bad feeling. Yeah. This is also Vetana. When you see someone you don't like, you feel bad. Yeah. That's, that's sensation. Next question from Malaysia, question number 27. Ajahn Dhamma talk on February 21st, 2018 to lay people from USA where a lay person asks whether a woman can become a Buddha. In the Majjhima Nikaya, it, it is said that it was impossible for a woman to become fully enlightened. My understanding is a woman could be a Sotapanna, Sakadagami, Anagami or Arahan, but not Pachika Buddha or Sama Sambuddha. Can Ajahn clarify please? Well, see, uh, in order to become enlightened, you can do it two, way, two ways. Be enlightened by yourself, self-enlightened, like the Buddha. And, and the other is to be taught by someone else, by, be taught by the Buddha. Then this is to become enlightened as the noble disciple. But the, the, the result is the same. Yeah, whether you become self-enlightened or you have been taught to become enlightened, you reach the same destination, which is Nibbāna. So there's no difference whether, whether you become a Buddha or you become a noble disciple. But as far as uh, sex is concerned, whether men or women, I think they may be talking from the, the historical perspective. During the time of, of the Buddha, it, um, men-dominated society. It's only men who, 
who lead, they, they have to go into war. So they have to be strong physically. So woman has no role in this. So they presume that to be a leader, to, to be a Buddha, you also need a strong body. But if you look at today's environment, it's, it's possible now for woman to be president, to be prime minister, to be queen, to lead, to lead, you know, to be a leader. So I think if you look from today's perspective, I think woman can become a Buddha also. Because becoming a, a Buddha doesn't require you to have a strong, uh, strong body. What you need to have is a strong mind. And everybody can develop the mind to become strong, whether you are a man or a woman. So, but I don't want to argue with, with the scriptures, you know. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter whether you, you become enlightened yourself or you become enlightened by, by learning from somebody else. It's the same result. You, you, you get to Nibbana. It's like coming here. You can drive your own car, you can ride with somebody else. But the, the result is the same. You are here, you get here. So let's not get uh, lose track of the, the real goal. Yeah. Don't worry whether you're a woman or not a woman. And don't worry whether you have to become a Buddha or become a noble disciple. It depends on the situation. The Buddha had to become a Buddha because no one teaches him. He went to study with so many teachers and they could not teach him to become enlightened. So then he has to experiment and find his enlightenment himself. But nowadays we have teachers, we have Buddha, we have Dhamma, we have Sangha to teach us to become enlightened. So, you know, why, 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 why waste time and say, no, I'm going to wait and go find, become enlightened myself, you know. So don't, don't worry about how you become enlightened. Worry more whether you are enlightened or not. Is that all? Okay. okay, we'll uh, finish them. Question number 28 from Malaysia, from Leslie Kim. There are times when in my quiet moments, I feel relaxed and at peace. So this thought of, I want to go home, arise. Does this mean that I am going to die soon? No, what you think doesn't indicate anything of the future. The future doesn't re depend on what you think. If the future depends on what you think, then just keep thinking, I'm going to be rich, I'm going to live forever. <laughs> then you'll be rich and you'll, be, you'll live forever. Yeah. Next question from Lim, Malaysia. My boyfriend cheated me twice in our relationship. We are still together. After many months passed, I realized that I still have underlying anger and mistrust towards him because of t the disloyalty. I'm not sure about what to do with these negative emotions. It's not negative, it's the truth. It's, it's what you call wisdom. You know. <laughs> but you should not have any negative feeling, that's all. You just have to know that this is the way he is. He's a disloyal man, so don't trust him. That's all you have to do. You are angry, you, you feel bad because you're angry. And you don't want him to be disloyal. So you have to get rid of this desire for, for, for him to not to be disloyal. Once you understand him and accept him for what it is he is, then you will not be angry, then you will not have any bad feeling toward him. But you also will not trust him anymore. Because like there's a saying, say, fool me once, uh, <laughs> what you call it? Somebody say, shame, shame. shame on me. Uh, uh, fool, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. <laughs> okay. Next question from Chi Fong Cheng, Hong Kong. Can I then give amulet of some dead for me? They are, they are not useful for, for any purpose. They are just like toys. They are for children. If you still want amulet, that means you, you, your mental state of mind is still in the state of children, childish. But if you are grown up, you will know that the real thing is the teaching of the Buddha and the practice following his teaching. Is that all the question? One more. Can I send you a private message? Huh? Can I send you a private message from Australia? No, because I don't have time to answer any private. I'm sorry, just you have to, to ask here and, and wait for the answer. All this question will be posted in the YouTube 
uh, channel called Dhamma in English. Yeah. Okay, thank you for all your, of your questions and keep them coming. Yeah. I'll be happy to answer. In the meantime, keep being mindful and being wise and eventually you'll become enlightened. <laughs>